This is the season for a new anointing. This is the season for a fresh outpouring. That the sons and daughters of the King of Glory may arise and shine. That the sons and daughters of the King of Glory may arise and shine as we declare. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. In the beginning God created, and for His pleasure all creation sings. Every son and daughter of the King of glory now arise and shine. Every son and daughter of the King of glory now arise and shine as we declare. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let your glory. I will rejoice, I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. You call me out upon the waters, the great unknown, where feet may fail. And there I find you in the mystery, in ocean sea, my faith will
Thank you for tuning in this morning. Sorry that we have to do this again online. Last week we were online. This week again we're online. But we have a, a large contingent within our congregation that has contracted the COVID-19 virus. We don't think they got it from coming to services, but it has been a surge in our community. And so to err on the side of, uh, of good judgment, the elders have decided we want to protect our at-risk community. And so we're not going to be having services today, as you know, and hopefully, we will not have it Wednesday night, but hopefully next Sunday we'll be able to meet again. We'll let you know. We're not going to meet on Wednesday night services again until the first Wednesday in December. So make note of that. You know, for the past many weeks, we've been teaching a series on the principles of living through a pandemic. While the health professionals have been working on dealing with the 
preventing this disease and, and dealing with this disease. I've been helping to navigate the dis-ease that this has created in your life. Just think of all the changes that you've had to go through since you've started. It, it, it's created a lot of stress in your life, a lot of dis-ease in your life. As a preacher, my job is to help you survive it, but not only help you survive it, to help you thrive during this pandemic. So each week we've been looking at the emotional side of COVID-19 crisis like anxiety and loneliness and frustration and anger and depression and grief. And we, we've looked at impatience. Now, if you've missed those messages, I encourage you to tune in to the lessons in the past. You can go on our YouTube channel, Facebook page, and see those things. But we've been looking in the book of James, a, a very small book in the Bible it's only got five chapters. It's written by the brother of Jesus. It's only 108 verses, but it's so packed with wisdom that it's taken all this time just to get through the first chapter. And I've told you that this book of James was written by the half-brother of, of Jesus, okay? And it was during a time when the church was going through a crisis, and it deals with crisis, as a matter of fact, it talks about how that the church was scattered. They were going through a crisis, but James is kind of a book like Proverbs in the Old Testament. And it looks as it's called wisdom literature, and it gives us some wisdom to deal in a crisis. And so we've been talking about that. We've been talking about how James tells us in James chapter 122, don't fall into self-deception. Don't deceive yourself. Don't fall into self-deception, but by merely listening to God's Word and thinking you've got it. No, do what it says. Be doers of the word. And we want you to be acting on what you believe. So James is saying if you don't just go out and you don't just study your Bible or you don't just go to church and let God's word go in one ear and out the other, he's saying that you've got to, if you're doing that, you're just fooling yourself. You're kidding yourself. You're self-deceived. He said if you hear the word of God and you don't do anything about it, you're just kidding yourself. Nothing really changes in your life, he says. You've got to put God's Word into practice. In James chapter 2, verse 14, he says, Dear brothers and sisters, what's the use of saying that you've got faith and you don't prove it by your actions? He says that kind of faith saves nobody. In other words, he's saying, you know, if you're going to talk the talk, you better walk the walk. What you profess you believe, you've got to practice in your life. And so, this lesson that we're going to do today is a very practical lesson. Actually, we started a couple of weeks on this. It's pretty straightforward verse. Doesn't need any interpretation. Doesn't need any explanation. But let me, let me tell you this. Let's be honest with each other. The truth is all of us know far more to do good than we're doing. That's the bottom line. I'm not worried about what the Bible teaches that I don't understand. I'm worried most about the things that the Bible teaches that I understand, but I'm falling short in. That's what we're doing in the book of James. It's looking at some practical things we can do. In James chapter 2, verse 8, he gives us the verse that we're going to be looking at. This royal law, this one that he gives us, he says, this royal law is found in the Scriptures. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. If you obey this law, you're doing right. That is it. That's it. For the rest of my time, I want to talk to you about how to do that. Not just hear that, but to do that. I want to talk about putting that into action. How are you going to love your neighbor as yourself during a pandemic? Mark chapter 12, 28 through 31. Of course, James is quoting for what is called the great commandment. Jesus talks about this, and he says this. A man asked Jesus, of all the commandments of God, which is the most important? And Jesus says this. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind and all your strength. That's the number one commandment the Lord has given us, to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he says, now the second commandment is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus said, there is no greater commandment no commandment greater than these. Now, notice he moves from first person singular to second person singular. There are no greater commandments than these two. Love God, love your neighbor. Well, what is it? One or two. God says they go together. 
You can't love God with all your heart and soul, mind and strength if you don't love your neighbor as yourself. And you can't love your neighbor as yourself if you don't love God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. So God considers them one commandment. They're two parts. Love God with all your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. But the story that we just read to you is not the only place in the Bible that the command to love your neighbor as yourself. Oh, no, no, no. This commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, is called the royal law of scriptures. It's repeated not once, not twice, not three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's repeated nine times in the Bible. You must love your neighbor as yourself. It's like God saying, come on, people. I don't want you to miss this. I don't want you to forget this. This is the top thing to do. You could get your list of all the things you think are important. If they don't fit within this criteria of loving God and loving your neighbor, then you've got it wrong. Don't minimize this. Love your neighbor as yourself. So how are we going to do that this next week during a pandemic? How are we going to be able to do that? You know, a lot of people talk about love, but they really don't know what love is. They think that love is a feeling that you feel when you feel a feeling you never felt before. And, and they think that's what love is. But love is not a feeling. Now, it may create feeling. But love is not a feeling because you can't command a feeling. Love is an action. God is act, act, commanding us to love our neighbor. The other thing that people make mistake is the myth that love is uncontrollable. You know, even the language we use, we say, you know, I fell into love. You know, like a ditch. You just fall into love. People assume that love can't be controlled, but it is an action. That's a myth. Love is a choice. Again, that's the number one thing you need to understand. Colossians 3.14. Put on love. It is like getting dressed. Now, you have a choice what shirt or blouse or pants or dress or whatever you have on. Love is a choice. You choose to love people and you choose not to love people. Love is a choice. Number two, love is an action. Love is something that you do. It, 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 he says, be doers of the word and not hearers only. First John 3, 18, let us not love with word, but love with actions. And so we learned that. So I gave you some principles for love. The first one that I gave you was get to know your neighbor individually. How are we going to practice this? How are we going to make this practical? You need to get to know your neighbor. You can't love somebody you do not know. You know, traveling around the world, I think, in 20-plus different countries, I mentioned before, that I, I've realized that America is different from a lot of other countries in the sense that a lot of us don't really know our neighbors. We have our garage door openers. We get to our house. We open the door. We go in. We close the door. We don't see our neighbors. Most countries I've been in, a lot of people, they know their neighbors. And so we need to get to know our neighbors let me give you a Bible verse, Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 24, the King James Version. To have friends, a man must show himself friendly. It, that makes sense. Uh, Romans 12 and verse 16, be friendly to everyone, but be, you know, be friendly. We need to learn to, to get to know our neighbors. Now, that's where we got to in that last lesson. Let me continue on. Number two, encourage my neighbor continually. Get to know my neighbor personally. Number two, encourage my neighbor continually. Do you know what? Everybody needs encouragement, especially now. Proverbs 12, 25. Worry weighs a person down, but an encouraging word cheers a person up. Everybody's worried right now. So everybody needs an encouraging word. By the way, one of the ways to encourage people is to give an encouraging Bible verse to your neighbor. You know, Romans chapter 15 and verse 4 says this. Everything written in the Scripture was written to teach us so that through the endurance and the encouragement of the Scriptures, we might have hope. Everybody needs hope right now. And where do they get it? From the Scriptures. Everybody needs encouragement right now. Where are they going to get it? From the Scriptures. The Bible says everything written in this book was written to encourage human beings. So share Scripture with people. And know three facts. You need to know this about everybody. Everybody you meet has a hurt. It may be hidden, but they have a hurt. Number two, everybody gets discouraged and everybody needs a lift. Let me, let me read some of the ideas that people have given me to encourage. Carol Barnes said, Mitchell, I've shared meals and baked goods with my neighbors, especially those who are widowers and alone. I have a good friend in Nashville who always says that she, she could cook and she could pray. And then she went on to say, that has become my mantra. That's just an encouragement. All right, here's another one. 
Bernice Atkinson and, and some of her friends have been doing this here. They, they said, I've made masks for my neighbors and with my neighbors. And, and they have. They've done a lot. I've gotten a bunch of masks from, from Bernice and, and several of our ladies here at church and passed them around. Another one said, we drop off some colored verse pages for neighbors who need encouragement. Another one wrote, I've been drawing encouraging Bible verses in chalk on my driveway many times since the pandemic began. Here's another one. We did a driveway concert for our neighborhood. This person could play the guitar, and then I encouraged him about Jesus. Here's another. We left a snack, an encouragement, an encouraging book for our mailman. All these different things. Somebody said our kids painted rocks with, with verses and, and encouraging words and left them for people to put up. I mean, we can do things. Michelle wrote, we made greeting cards with Starbucks cards and our church's information and put them in it and gave it to our neighbors. We took photos of, uh, of a chalk art and sent them around to different people. Let me ask you, are you an encourager or are you an, a discourager? What would people say? Do you give more compliments or do you give more complaints? Do you give more strokes or do you give more pokes? Here's how you do the second most important command in life. You get to know your neighbor individually, and you start encouraging them continually. Encourage my neighbor continually. Number three, I need to serve my neighbor cheerfully. Now, I need to learn how to serve my neighbor cheerfully. That means that, you know, we, we, we need to meet their needs, physical needs, emotional needs, spiritual needs, practical needs, whatever they need. 1 Peter 4 and verse 10 says this, Each of you have been blessed by God with many wonderful wor wor gifts. Now, what are those gifts for? You've been blessed with some wonderful gifts by God. You're supposed to use those for people around you. So use your gifts in serving others. That's what First Peter tells us. You see, God has given you talents, gifts, abilities, skills, backgrounds, all these different things that weren't given to you for, just for your benefit. They're given to you for the benefit of others. Your gift is your benefit for others. Others' gifts are their benefit for you. My gift is your benefit. Your gift is my benefit. My, but attitude is incredibly important here. I said serve your neighbor cheerfully. Psalm 102 says serve the Lord cheerfully. Not as a grouch, not as a grump. Not say, well, you know, I need to serve my neighbor. Oh, man. Jesus said if you want to be great, you learn to be a servant of all. Now, meeting needs and helping and serving other people is how you show love. It's in, in your actions. That's how you show love. 1 John chapter 3, 17. If we have what we need, in 1 John 3, 17, if we have what we need and we see others in need, but we turn a cold shoulder and we do nothing about it, then the love of God is not, is not in us. It is not in us. We're just, we're just faking it. And I've been preaching for 30 some odd years. And I come up with this, it, you're it principle. You see a need, you're it. You're the answer. People come to me and say, well, Mitchell, I, I see this need. I think the church should do something about it. I say, great, you're it. <laughs> Go for it. If you see a need, claim it. Get to know your neighbor personally. Encourage your neighbor continually. Serve your neighbor cheerfully. And there's so many different ways that you can serve your neighbor. The fourth thing is invite your neighbor to watch online. You say, well, <laughs> invite your neighbor to watch online. You say, Mitchell, wait a minute. Where's the verse in the Bible that says about anything about online church? Nothing. And you're right. But Jesus told a parable to explain the importance of bringing people to God. In Luke chapter 14, 23, he says, Then the master said, listen to this, I want you to go out everywhere. I want you to go out everywhere people are, to highways and to hedges, and urge anyone that you can find to come into my house so that my house will be full. That's a direct quote. God wants a full house. Now, of course, right now, a lot of church houses around the world have been shut down because of the pandemic. Well, that's okay. We now have technology. We can invite people to join us online, and just watch our service online. In fact, did you know that more people are now open right now to an invitation to church services than at any other point in their entire lifetime, in my lifetime? People are hungry for the church. In the first place, there's no competition. 
They're hungry for truth. They're hungry for meaning. They're hungry for hope. They're hungry for comfort. They're hungry for wisdom. They're hungry for God. This is the time of all times that we need to invite people to, to watch our service online. You know, I read a survey this week. It was kind of interesting. It said that 53% of young people, 53% of all people under the age of 35 have gone online and watched the church service online during the pandemic. That's amazing. I mean, coming from a generation says, that says, I've given up on church, over half, 53% of young people under the age of 35 have gone online and watched the church service because they feel a need in their heart for spiritual maturity and spiritual depth and spiritual food. So have you invited anybody? Have you invited anybody? Have you told anybody, you know, you ought to check out Line Aries' uh, YouTube channel or, or Facebook page. You need, to, you need to invite people. Then the next thing you need, you need to do is share Christ personally. Tell them what you did. You need to learn how to explain to your neighbor how you became a friend of Jesus. It isn't that hard, friends. I mean, it's, it's one beggar telling another beggar how to get bread. The greatest gift that you could ever give your neighbor, the greatest love that you could ever show your neighbor is to show them Jesus. 1 Peter 3, 15 and 16 says this. Always be prepared to give an answer. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that's within you. But he says, do this with gentleness and respect. You don't have to be a salesman. You don't, have to, you don't need to be an attorney. You don't need to be a defense lawyer. The most loving thing you could do is just say, here's what Jesus has done for me. And you tell them about Jesus. Notice he says, be ready to answer. You know what? That involves words. Be ready to answer. I mean, I've heard people say, well, I, I don't need, I have to talk about Jesus. My life is my witness. Sorry, that's not good enough. Even Jesus had to explain it, and he was as perfect as they get. Even Jesus had to explain the good news of forgiveness. The good news of God has a purpose for your life. The good news that God loves you, and he'll never stop loving you. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 14, Christ's love compels us to do that. I want you to have the joy and privilege of sharing with Jesus. Let me end by telling you my dream for this church. My dream for this church is that we become a church that where during this time of COVID-19 pa pandemic, that people, our neighbors will say, you know what? That church is where everybody's a good neighbor. That they are good neighbors. If you live next to somebody who's a member of Lion Air Church, you're lucky because Lion Air members are the very best neighbors in the world. They love God. They love their neighbor. Wouldn't that be great? Would you bow with me? Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love. Father, we thank you for the ability to be able to love others. Father, we thank you for what you've done for this church. Be with those that are suffering during this time of pandemic. Father, ask that you make us to be a people that love you more and love our neighbors. For us in Christ's name we do pray. And amen. All to Jesus I surrender all To Him I freely give I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily I surrender humbly at His feet I bow Worldly pleasures all forsaken Take me, Jesus, take me now Surrender